Jack Shankox with Peak, the, the possible microphone uh, to hear about his experience after Shark Tank, as well as any pivots that might have taken place since he last presented early um, spring of last year. And then we'll be followed by our own Scott Sorensen to talk about how his company was able to help um, Peak choose their marketing agency. So with that, Shane, welcome. Or welcome back, actually. Yeah, it's malfunctioning. There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. So I guess I'm supposed to stand here, right? So who, who was here when I so I presented in May of this last year? Right. This oh, it's dying. Turn it on. Switch. Well, anyway, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> so, so I didn't see. So who, who saw my last presentation? So not many. Um, so my actual product, so I came and presented on my product, which is called the Cue Ball. Um, so the Cue Ball is a throwable microphone. So the idea behind it is when you're in a large group setting like this, you have Q&A with a presenter. Uh, it makes it a little more dynamic, more engaging than just walking around with a handheld mic. Um, our primary market is actually education. So we sell mostly to K through six is kind of our sweet spot there, but throughout the whole education market, K through higher ed, um, and the idea in a classroom is, is, again, is getting students to engage in classroom discussions, um, getting them to participate. Many times you have shy students or quiet talkers that maybe they're hard to hear. Um, uh, and sadly, the way our, our school system is going right now is we have increasing classroom sizes and um, we're having um, an aging teacher population because there's a lot of turnover in the younger age teachers. So it kind of creates this perfect storm of, of audio issues that can happen in a classroom. Um, so we, I came up with the product about two and a half years ago, um, did a crowdfunding campaign for it, um, and then really just started selling in January of last year. Um, so I was going to give you kind of a quick update. It's, it's a, I guess, a good moment for me being the new year to give a good recap of 2017, because that was a, it's a, been a big year for us. So I, I'm actually not from the Raleigh area. I moved here about a year ago. Um, this is a project I've been working on. And we, you know, we ran into stumbling blocks and issues in getting manufacturing done. It was, you know, a typical crowdfunding campaign. We got the money and blew past our deadline, and the next deadline, and the deadline after that, and you know, required me to go. I flew out and spent about a month and a half in China with our manufacturer to get them in gear. Um, so it was one of those things that, you know, sometimes you have this new idea, this new venture, and you get really gung ho about it, you get excited about it, and then when things drag on. <laughs> Sometimes it becomes a challenge to keep that uh, that commitment and focus. Um, so what happens? We actually moved here to Raleigh uh, mostly for the business. Um, I do a lot of trade shows. Is how I usually sell. Um, get in front of a lot of teachers. And being I was on the West Coast before, and a lot of the major cities you're a lot more isolated. Where here a lot there's a lot more in driving distance. Help keep my cost down. So that's kind of the main reason that we moved here. Um, but it wasn't to the point where it was what I could live off of. I was, you know, any penny that we made from it was going back into helping fund the production and everything else. So when I moved here to Raleigh, I was actually going to be cleaning carpets was my side gig. Um, so I had flipped a house in California um, and was used all the money from that, dumped in it. I'm going to do this little ca carpet cleaning side business, just something to keep paying the bills, but still give me the flexibility of working on my, my, my idea, on my, uh, my product. Um, so when we moved here, we tried it and it, it flopped. It didn't work. I, I pretty much dumped all my remaining resources into advertising to get this carpet cleaning business going and it didn't work. Um, so last minute I ended up, I, I put up Christmas lights for people, which is something I had done in the past. So I did that the month of December, gave me this little kind of nest egg and was trying to figure out, okay, what is the path going forward? I don't want to like drop this, but it's, I, I couldn't see a, a clear way to make this happen. Um, so I actually flew to California is where we moved from to pick up the last of our stuff. So we had it all packed in a little 14-foot U-Haul that was, it was actually my father-in-law's that he was letting us use it to drive here with the hopes of selling it here. So it had about 300 and something thousand miles on it. So drove across the country on a wing and a prayer. Um, but during that drive, I was listening to a book on tape and there was an interesting part was talking about commitment. And I came to this realization that I was just at this point, I was getting my first inventory in, I would have stuff to sell, I had the revenue there. I could make this my full-time thing. I could, I could live off of this now 
It just depended on my commitment level. So at that point, I recommitted to focusing on this and making it happen. Um, so the first few months of this last year were great. We, we started rolling in the cells. Um, things were doing really well. Um, and I had this, you know, I, I've always had in this back of my head this idea of going on Shark Tank. I mean, a lot, I'm sure a lot of people, this one's dead too. So I'm sure a lot of people that's, you know, especially if you have a hard product, that's always just, hey, that would be a cool thing to go on the show. Um, so I'd actually gone to two open casting calls before. So I, I tried twice before to get on. Um, but I heard they were having an open casting call in Charlotte. And uh, so it was this moment of, this is something that's always just sitting in the back of my head, and I felt like before when I'd gone, I hadn't necessarily committed to it all the way. I kind of uh, hedged, hedged my bets a little, or hedged a little bit on what my market was. I didn't want to say my market's education, because for a lot of investors, that's a, like an automatic get out of here. I don't want to deal with education. But I went to the, the open casting call and I just decided, you know, I'm going to go in, I'm going to own this, and I'm going to give it everything I've got so I can at least walk away feeling like I tried it, I've got that like off my plate. If it doesn't work out, then it just wasn't meant to be. Um, so I went, I don't know, did any of you see my episode on Shark Tank? So I, to go to the casting call, what's an interesting thing there is, is you're really going to pitch, it's not like an investor pitch, you're pitching a casting agent. So you get 60 seconds, it's like American Idol style, you got 60 seconds to try to impress them on your product, on whatever it is. And really for them, their, their top level, what's interesting to them is the story, is the personality, is the person, the product's secondary to that, and the business is kind of well below that as far as the show itself. So if you saw the show, I came on, my product kind of looks like a dodgeball, so. So, so I came wearing some short shorts and <laughs> And yeah, it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> but at that time, I went to the open casting call because I'm like, I'm going to be there with like 500 people. So if I'm going to make an impression, I'm going to do it. And they ended up, you know, pulling me aside and had me a video when I was singing karaoke. And I, you know, <laughs> I was kind of, you know, I don't care what it is. I don't, I, embarrassment's secondary to, you know, if this is going to get it going. So, so this was actually that casting calls before I presented with One Million Cups. And it's, and it's a process to get on the show. It's not this one step thing. And there's at any point, there's there's always the disclaimer that this is no guarantee. Even even once you go and film, there's still no guarantee you may err. Um, so lucky lucky for me. So we did go and film. Uh, we aired, um, and we did get a deal with three of the sharks. Um, so that's you know it's it's an amazing experience. It was frightening and and, and a ton of fun. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a great boost for visibility of the company. It's a it's a great opportunity for resources. But at the end of the day, you still have to run a business, right? If you don't have the fundamentals of it there, you can you can go look through all the companies that have been on Shark Tank and see how many of them are no longer in business. You know, it's not a guarantee of success. Um, so we've learned a lot going through the process. Um, you know, one of the great things with being here was finding resor local resources. So, you know, you only get two or three weeks of notice before you air, which isn't a whole lot of time to prepare, you know, website-wise, everything else. So I was able to pull from local resources and say, hey, I need to find, we need to get retargeting set up, we need to get, we need to at least have, you know, some way to capture this data when we're getting this big flood of traffic coming in. Um, so that was a great resource to have here, is that I, from people that I'd met from presenting here previously, One Million Cups. Um, so we haven't really, the, the, the business model has stayed the same. We're still focused on schools. The Sharks were very excited about the business applications of it, um, which we're, we're starting to spend some more focused marketing lines on looking at the business applications. Um, some of that, to really fit that market, there's some, some tweaks need to be made to the product itself. So we're in the process of looking at kind of making those changes before we put too much money towards the business applications. Um, but I'll tell you, so in the, you know, from the first year till we aired on Shark Tank, so we'd done probably just under $200,000 in sales this year, up into the point the show aired, we were maybe maybe 350, something like that. So in the three months since we've aired, so we've done um, just shy of 600,000 in sales. So you know, it's it's definitely been a, a big boost to us. It's not there's there's people that go on there that they have millions in sales the first night, right? We're a different product. We're not necessarily general consumer focused. Um, but for me, the, the great opportunity from it is, you know, we saw a ton of online sales come from this, and most of those online sales were single unit sales. 
which for me, I view those all as that's a seed that we just planted in a school somewhere in the country for the most part. As a teacher that bought it, we've got one in that school now, which gives us a good leg in to once we go back to say, hey, are you liking it? How are you using it? And hopefully the teachers around them are excited about it and they can help kind of drive the cells through there. So that's kind of a general update on, on kind of what's happened since we've, we've moved here, since we've been on the show. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions about the product, about the show, anything in general. Yeah, what are your channels of sales? I mean, how do you sell? I mean, yeah. Certainly online, it sounds like. Yeah, so initially it was all just direct sales. And, and part of that was strategic because we wanted to make sure we were in more direct contact with our end user um, to make sure if we needed to make changes or tweaks to the product, which we've made some, some little minor changes to the product based on that feedback. Um, just before the show aired, we brought on our first reseller. Um, so they're, again, they're education-focused resellers. Um, and the advantage with those is they have relationships already built with a lot of these schools and districts. Um, and depending on the state that we sell into, there's challenges from a procurement standpoint. So uh, like New York, Texas, um, California, especially those, which those are big states with a lot of money to spend, um, is those states, there's a, you know, a lot of schools have to go through a competitive bid process or you've got to be set up as a approved vendor, which can become a big, long hassle. So we've started to bring on resellers that when we hit those hurdles that we can kind of pass them off um, as a hot lead to them. Um, and then they're hopefully going out and selling it as well. What are three things you learned from the sharks? You know? uh, three things that I learned from the sharks. Um, again, I mean, they, they the, one of the things that I thought was interesting that didn't actually make it on the show, obviously you film more than is aired. They, they would have let down to 10 or 15 minutes, but I think the big thing, so I ended up, I, one of the sharks I had gone in after was Mark Cuban. He, he was kind of my, my, my main guy I was going after. Um, and the one thing that really spoke to him that, that didn't, they didn't air in the show was, you know, they kept pounding at me on education. That, oh, this is, you're, I'm gonna be dead before I make my money back on this. This is, you know, they just kept pounding on it. And I tried to explain to them, you know, why selling hardware to schools is a little bit different than software, which is what they're used to. Um, and they, they said, well, I need a business. You could, you could make, 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 or make way more money with business. I said, well, I'm just a one-man show. Like, if I don't have a focus, I'm not going to get anything done. And Mark was, like, almost out of his seat. He was like, I wish more people that came on here understood that. They get on here, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this market, and this market. So that was the one thing I felt like that was a, a validation, I guess, that I kind of stuck to my guns on it and didn't necessarily spread myself too thin. Um, it's interesting on the back end seeing how they all work. They're all they all have different approaches. Um, and the nice thing from my perspective is versus a traditional VC is they probably have different expectations of what success looks like. Because you know they're beyond the show. Yes, they are there to make investments to make money, but a lot of it's just about you know visibility, their brand, everything else. So if if you're having any success, they're they're happy with that. Where they're not necessarily looking for a turn and burn. Since there is such a challenge selling into education, which I think everybody can appreciate, it sounds like government. Um, was the was any of the input to take it to a consumer tech, like like make it a consumer product? At least first tease that to get better exposure and. Yeah, we've talked about that a little bit, and that's more Lori. So we did it with Lori Brainer, who's the, the queen of QVC. So that's kind of more her standpoint on things. Is she's looking at some kind of retail applications potentially. Um, some of that, you know, maybe a challenge from a cost perspective. Our, our system costs $180, um, which for a classroom, that's actually a pretty cheap price for a lot of the classroom hardware. From a consumer perspective, it's okay. What's what's the value for them, and is 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 the value worth that type of spend? And it just. Uh, an overall question. How'd you choose the size? Because I look at the size and it's bigger than I thought it would be. So yeah, so it's an eight inch diameter ball. Um, so which is, you know, similar to a, kind of between a soccer ball and a basketball. Um, it was mostly gauged around the fact that again, we were selling to little kids so that bigger size was easier for them to catch, gave more protection for all of our internal components. Um, so we've looked since then, at, okay, what are, what are different form factors that we can take? Um, we're looking, so one, one of the great things that came out of the show is you kind of, get bombarded by opportunity afterwards, so it's hard to sift through all the different things and, and what's legit and what's not. Um, one of the good opportunities is I met a manufacturer out of Atlanta 
Um, so we're actually going to be moving all the, the, the production of the foam balls itself to Atlanta, um, which they can do it at the same cost that we're paying overseas. And then right now, when we ship, we're shipping mostly volume, not weight. We've got a bunch of foam that we're shipping. Um, so it cuts down a lot on that. And they're actually giving us a, a better product. So the, the, the owner of the company is a, has his doctorate in chemical engineering of some kind, and it's all about the formulation. So he's able to match you know, our weight and density characteristics, but make it more durable than our current product. So it's great to be able to find resources like that, again, that come out of this exposure. Shane, great story, and thanks for coming back to give us an update. Uh, I wanted to go back to what you said about commitment, and I'd love to hear a bit more about kind of your mindset before and after that, sh that, that, that insight that hit. Yeah, so again, it's just looking at, sometimes again, if, if, if the process, well, the more it gets drawn out, it's sometimes difficult to keep that, that full head-on commitment. I mean, I've, we've, for this product, we've, we, I sold my house, I sold businesses that I owned, um, I did road trips, you know, sleeping in the back of my car in the Walmart parking lot. So it's not like I didn't have a level of commitment before, but it's something that you have to recommit to. There, there's a point where you, your, your interest, your excitement wanes a little bit. And, you know, for me, sometimes it's going to the trade shows. That's why I like them is, is getting the feedback from my customers. That gives me a boost and helps kind of fuel my commitment for it. Um, but then some of it's, it's creating a clear path moving forward is knowing, like I said, my, my big commitment in January was I hit this point where I, I looked at all the numbers. I knew, okay, I've got, I've got product coming in. I've been waiting a year and a half to have a physical product to sell. It, it was a game changer versus, you know, work, even, even trade shows before that, it's hard selling an idea to somebody. Selling, this is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to work. Give me money and you might see it in a year. That's a hard thing versus having it here it is. You want it here, you can buy it right now. So for me, it was, I could see this clear path forward and knew the only thing that was holding me back was getting sales. And so I knew I could, I, I mean, I'm not a salesman, that's not my forte, but I can do it, right? So it was just knowing that I had this clear path forward and, and then just going after it. Shane, that was very interesting. Did, would your ball work in this room? Yeah, so we had it here last time and I was hoping to bring one here too, but you know, one of the challenges of, of getting exposure like that is from an inventory perspective. Um, so we'd actually been back ordered since about the 13th of October. Um, we got a big shipment. Um, so we'd ordered, you know, up to that point, we don't, I'd only been ordered a thousand at a time because I had to front the cash up front for 50% down. It was a big long process. So getting on the show, we ordered, we placed an order for 5,000 units. Um, but we had some delays with some of the production, so we were having to air freight some stuff and, and ship some on the boat, and I ended up flying out to California to go pick it up in port, kit it all, and ship it there to get it to people before Christmas. Um, so the rest of my order is on a truck somewhere between here and there, so I, I would have brought one to use here, but I have none. I, I understand that. One thing I'd suggest for your future is never go anywhere without one. <laughs> I mean, you, you'll be sitting in a, in a diner or you'll be sitting in a group or you'll be with another group of businessmen and they might want to throw one around yeah. and say, oh yeah, we'd like to buy 10 of these or 20 of these. I think as you go forward, it would be a very good marketing idea to, for you never to not have one. Yeah, well, what's funny is when we went on the show, if, if you watch the show again, we had a, had a little like ball card like at the gym, you know, I had one of those yeah. full of them. Those were literally the last ones that I had. <laughs> So when the show has ended, a couple of them wanted to take him. I was like, oh, I'll send you one later. <laughs> I need that. Hi. Sorry, I'm still blank. Um, so a question about the education resellers. Like, how did you find? How did you find them? I guess I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that whole process. That's a new thing. Um, yeah. So so again, I, I do a lot of trade shows, so I meet a lot of them there. Um, <laughs> The challenge for us with looking at resellers was our price point, which for the end user, 179, that's a good price point for the school to pay. But for a reseller that makes their money off of margins, right? If they're getting, you know, 20 points to 30 points on a $179 item versus a $6,000 flat panel, it's hard to maybe incentivize them to put the effort into selling it. Um, so initially what we did is the first reseller that we brought on to kind of deal with them was, is hey, we're gonna have all these inbound leads for purchase orders from the showing, and I don't know that we've got the bandwidth to handle them. So we took and peeled off a lot of those to them. Hopefully as a way to get their salespeople excited about it and realize that 
okay, maybe, yes, it's not a high margin item, but is it an easy sell? Is it a good lead-in item? Is it a good leave-behind item for when they're going out and do a sales pitch to a school? Is it something that will say, hey, we'll leave this with you, come back in two weeks and see how it works? Is it a good, easy way to follow up? Um, so getting that first one on board kind of helped us give us some ideas of, of what was working with them, what isn't. Um, and then from there, it's more, we've actually, we had a lot of resellers that reached out to us after the airing, so it was just kind of whittling through and seeing, okay, are they in the markets that we want? Are, are they competing with each other? And kind of um, be more strategic about what partners we bring on. Yeah, what's the, what's the next big thing that, uh, that's either in the plans or that could happen? that would scale you up like an order of magnitude or something yeah like so one of the one of the opportunities that came out of it that we're working on is is if you're if you haven't been in a classroom in the last few years a lot of people aren't aware that this is becoming more commonplace that a typical standard elementary school classroom is outfitted with a set of seating speakers and the teacher wears a little pendant mic all day so the idea behind it is the teachers can be mobile throughout the classroom um, doesn't matter which way they face the students can help still hear them equally um, and there's a few big companies that have, have kind of sold in that space for a long time. So the one company that they basically pioneered the whole idea, um, we just met with them a few weeks ago that we're looking at partnering with them. They have 300,000 systems in classrooms right now that right now they, they all come with a handheld student microphone that very often doesn't get used because it's not really, it's not fun, it's not conducive to like a free flow classroom discussion and if it gets dropped it's a $300 mic that's down the drain. So we've talked with them about partnering, they want to actually sell our system to all their existing schools and then we're looking at a way that we can integrate with their existing system too. So it's sometimes it's opportunities like that. Um, and then just looking at kind of where is where's technology moving in the classroom, where are the trends going and, and how do we fit into that. Uh, so one piece that we're looking at is you know, classroom um, video capture is becoming a more popular thing where the teacher can just record their lecture every day for, there's multiple uses, whether the, the teacher is using that themselves for, you know, review to look at how they're, how well they're doing. Um, some schools are starting to record stuff and make that, all that video available to their students um, and parents. So as a parent, you know, I was taught math a certain way. My, my, when my 12 year old comes home with math, it's, I know how to get the answer, but the way they're teaching them is different. So if I had access to that day's lecture, just go pull up the video and see how the teacher taught it and what the students' questions were, that's invaluable. So that's kind of forward we're looking where we're looking at doing is, okay, how do we, we become the audio piece for that, that audio video capture in a classroom. Shane, what, what uh, resources are you looking for right now, if any? So right now, I, and I, Again, part of the problem with, with, with exposure is we're, we drown in resources at some point. It's trying to, again, figure out what the focus is um, moving forward. Um, the one resource I am looking for is, is we're looking at doing some, uh, obviously, some future stuff and growth and changing the product a little bit. So we're looking for um, some resources from a, a PCB electronics design perspective. We've, we found one group here locally. Um, we're looking for more to get a competitive bid there. Um, just so we can, again, start moving the process. Initially, it's still, I, I, fi I finally hired on my first employee this last week. <laughs> so it would be nice to have a little bit of help. Um, but for, at this point, you know, I, I'm still not at this, the point where I can bring out a bunch of engineers to design everything in-house. So we utilize, you know, third-party resources for that. So if anybody knows of a good board design house or people, persons, so is it, is it wireless or, or yeah, so technology? Yeah, so it's wireless, so it's 2.4 gig wireless. So we've already, for our redesign, we've already determined the chipset that we want to use for it. We just need somebody to actually design it out for us. Do you know about Blur? I don't know about Blur. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay, hi. Back here again. Sorry. Um, you said before you went on to Shark Tank that you did a crowdfunding campaign. Um, would you reconsider that or maybe, you know, I guess the whole crowdfunding to Shark Tank to where you are now, I guess, are there any steps that you, you know, kind of would have, could have, should have? Um, I mean, I, I would still have done my crowdfunding over again because it gave me, obviously it gave me people to, to bounce ideas off of. Um, it gave me some validation for the idea. Um, as far as 
that helping out with Shark Tank, it didn't at all. They, you know, I think in the early days of the show, success on crowdfunding was, was a good indicator for them, where now they say, okay, well, you can, there's a lot of companies that do this awesome crowdfunding campaign and then fail horribly after that because they don't know how to continue to engage their customers or find their customers. Um, so there wasn't necessarily a, a direct line between those two, um, but, but again, from a crowdfunding perspective, for me, it was a positive outcome. Did I really make, I think once you took how much money we put into it to, to get the money we raised, we probably came out even on it. <laughs> I didn't necessarily come ahead, but it gave us, again, a good group of backers. And I love when I go to trade shows that I run into people that were backers, that they were like, hey, I hated you for some point because you we were waiting on this product and you had all my money, but you guys came through and they love us now. So, it, <laughs> so there's a little bit of a track there, but um, I think for us the key was just transparency with them is when we were having manufacturing issues, personalizing it and letting them know, hey, this is just me. Like I'm not some big corporation. This is what's going wrong. This is what I'm doing to fix it. If you can stick with me, great. If not, I'll refund your money right now. Shane, what um, after Shark Tank, what was the process and what is the process like for st with the sharks staying involved? Do you report back to them periodically? Do they check in with you? Yes, we actually have weekly emails with them. Um, so they, I mean, just kind of low level, they want to know what the wins are, what the losses are, what you need help with, uh, what kind of resources you need. Um, and the response varies. So I sometimes I get responses back from Mark personally, which is frightening and exciting but <laughs> but but generally they're what's nice about it is again they're not there to take over the business and run it for you they want to know okay what help do you need and how can we help you out um, and and just to give good good feedback from it and and again the the nice thing is expectation wise you know they they're okay with us you know going for the long haul on this versus trying to take and sell it in a couple of years which you know we're open to any option on it but it's, it's nice knowing that we can choose either path and they're okay with that. Um, I'm sure you get uh, better advice from the sharks than anything that I could offer, but uh, it, it sounds to me like, um, you know, obviously you, you would never want to have too much inventory um, because, you know, you're going to lose your shirt on, yep. on all of that. But you can run the risk of having too little. Yep. And, it, and it almost sounds like, at least in the early stages, you, you were kind of in yep. in that area. I'm curious, what what sort of advice did you get from the Sharks or anybody else on how to figure out what that right point is? Or are you still in that process? Uh, I mean, we're still figuring out to an extent. I mean, part of it is throughout the whole process. And that's when I went on the show, they said, why do you need the money? And that was it was primarily inventory because it was all, for the most part, self-funded. I did have a, a small kind of angel and seed investment from some family and friends that was to pay for the first production run. But after that point, I didn't want to keep giving up equity for inventory, right? So, and and we didn't necessarily have the track record to where a bank's going to give us a loan to be able to handle that type of thing. Um, so it was, it was just a challenge of, we'd get inventory in, we'd try to sell through and get the next pr purchase going before we ran out. But we've had, we've had challenges with our manufacturer where they've been They've been behind on pretty much every order, so <laughs> that adds another another kink to it. But this, you know, with with the money that we we got from the sharks, plus um, plus the money from just the revenue from the sales from the show, we're on a much better track to make sure that we're always on top of that. And we're not running out of inventory again. Hi, I apologize if you've already uh, covered this. I walked in a few minutes late. Um, You've got it. Uh, you priced it at uh, 179 dollars. Um, how has your uh, targeted price uh, fluctuated over the course of your progress? Um, so originally, our, our original kind of targeted price was 150 bucks. Is what we we're trying to come in at. So that's with our crowdfunding campaign. That was kind of our target price point. Um, but cost of goods ended up coming in a little bit more than we expected once we added some accessories and packaging and stuff that you didn't we didn't necessarily plan for initially um, so the 179 was it was when we got out of pre-order I thought okay this is a chance where we could raise the price without causing too much issue where before it had been a pre-order so it was a lower price of the pre-order and we really didn't get any pushback at all on that 
$29 price jump, but it gave us a lot more, it gave us more wiggle room for resellers. You know, if we were selling at that 150 price point and then we we're having to give margin to resellers, it probably wouldn't have been an option. Um, so the 179 has been helpful from that. Um, as far as consumer or the, the end customer, it really varies widely from state to state. Again, I do, I do a lot of trade shows and, and I can tell instantly when I've gone into a new state within the first half hour of the show whether it's going to be a good show or not. Because their immediate reaction is either, oh wow, this is a lot cheaper than I thought, or oh wow, yeah, we're never going to be able to afford that. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I did just at the uh, end of this last year, I did a show in, in South Carolina and Atlanta, or in Georgia. She wouldn't think they'd be that different. They're, they're fairly close to each other, but wildly different reactions for people as far as where their money's coming from. Um, and the one thing that's interesting from a school perspective is, again, the general perception is they don't have money. But as I say, the one district that's given us the most sales in the whole country is Calcasieu Parish School Board in Sulphur, Louisiana, <laughs> which is mostly Title I low-income schools but they have grant monies, they have federal money coming in. There's, there's ways that if it's something that they want, they can find a way to make it happen. We have time for do, one last question. Do you, uh, have, with your product, John, have you uh, bundled it with some of your other partners so your overall project for a school might be millions of dollars and this is insignificant compared to that? Yeah, so that's what we're looking at, like what the one company audio enhancement that does the classroom audio systems, their systems, you know, run 1300 bucks a classroom on average. So to add this on is a really, really simple value add for them that gets more use out of the entire system overall. Um, so we have not outside of just them. I mean, we've had some talks of, you know, I've talked with a couple phone companies that say, hey, is this going to work with our phone system for our video conferencing? But again, there's some, there's some product development that needs to be done to really fit that market better. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.